Hello, everyone, and welcome to this sixth Geopolitical Economy Hour, the fortnightly show on the political and geopolitical economy of our times. I'm Radhika Desai. And I'm Michael Hudson. Um, as you know, we the last time when we closed, we were scheduled to do our fourth and final show on the subject of de-dollarization. However, as you know, the best laid plans can be uh, thrown awry. Uh, as Harold Macmillan says, by events, dear boy, events. Uh, when we published the fifth show, uh, since we published the fifth show, we've had, of course, what looks like the biggest financial crisis since 2008 and 2020 on our hands, with the usual flurries of bailouts uh, and, 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 and emergency actions, which in other words, amounts simply to a socialism for the rich. So of course, Michael and I had to devote um, our show today to that topic. So we're gonna talk about how this crisis is no isolated crisis, but really another chapter in the long unraveling of the US financial system, an unraveling in which the really public character of banking, that is to say, the fact that banking is all, always meant to be a public reality becomes manifest under the pretense that it can be maintained as a private uh, system. So the crisis has uh, now been declared as over by some, at least, uh, uh, you know, uh, and the markets seem to be calm. Uh, but nevertheless, they have been extremely rocky. Uh, Madam Yellen said uh, on, thurs uh, on Thursday, March 16th, to the Senate Banking Committee that she said, I can assure you that, to the members of the committee that our banking system is sound. So basically, she's saying banking crisis, what banking crisis? But of course, Michael, you and I have a different view, don't we? Well, what she said were words that uh, uh, you never want any, uh, you never want to hear from a regulator that everything is sound. That means things are falling apart. Uh, and her next words, the rest of that sentence, were that Americans can feel con confident that their deposits will be there when they need them. Uh, in other words, yeah, what, Yeltsin, what uh, Yel um, Yellen said was that uh, she actually acknowledged that the United States banking system is insolvent. Uh, indeed, she said that uh, uh, forget uh, the promises that we're going to limit uh, deposit guarantees only to 250,000. We are uh, now guaranteeing all depositors uh, in the system. Uh, the uh, banking system is now a branch of the U.S. Treasury, uh, and the whole value of the U.S. Treasury is behind the banking deposit. There's no more risk. Uh, essentially, uh, it would appear at first glance that she'd uh, nationalize the banks. But really, what happened was that, uh, uh, unbeknown, it wasn't reported in the newspaper, but she's just taken a mid-level job at uh, Wells Fargo, uh, maybe it was uh, Citibank, uh, uh, saying that the Treasury is now a subgroup of uh, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, Chase Manhattan, and uh, the large banks. Uh, the, the banking system has uh, done, uh, kind of cannibalized uh, the Treasury and mobilized the whole Treasury for uh, for its banking, this is uh, people had for a long time uh, wanted uh, the idea of public banking. Uh, they'd wanted banking to be a public utility, but now uh, the treasury itself has become a private uh, privatized as a, a banking utility. And uh, given the sort of widespread awareness of insolvency, uh, when the Standard & Poor downgraded uh, the entire banking system last week, uh, the Treasury uh, essentially is making a commitment that uh, we will back up whatever the private banking system has done. Uh, we're not going to regulate it anymore because, after all, we never have been regulating it uh, for the last uh, uh, 20 years. And uh, th uh, they, this is supposed to make it more efficient. Get government out of the picture. Just turn everything over to uh, uh, the big big banks uh, to, uh, to manage. Uh, a public bank would have uh, why do we need the banking system in this case? That really is what everybody should ask and what I think our show, uh, our discussion today is going to be about. A public bank has no reason, uh, logic to uh, speculate in derivatives. A public bank wouldn't have to uh, invest in treasury securities because uh, it would be 
part of the treasury. Uh, it wouldn't lend for derivatives. It wouldn't make takeover loans. It wouldn't do all of the things that have led to the collapse, not only of uh, Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank, but to uh, most of the banking system with its uh, reported $630 billion of uh, uh, losses on its uh, capital account, its, its assets that uh, it doesn't have to report uh, because of the way in which uh, bank reporting uh, is uh, based on fantasy prices, not market prices. Quite so, Michael. You put it so well because basically, when when you when when you can't have a, a, a banking as a public utility, then inevitably what happens is that the government becomes a private utility. That's exactly what's going on. And of course, because it is you're trying to make something into what it isn't and in fact cannot be, the process is bound to be fraught with great contradictions. So of course, you're absolutely right to point to the fact that Madam Yellen has essentially bailed out the depositors, extended deposit insurance to all the depositors, not just up to the $250,000 of a couple of banks. But what's also really interesting is that she has had to stop shy of extending it formally to all banks. All they've said is that they will try to bail out other banks if they are systemically important, etc. So we'll just have to see how it rolls along. Now, what has emerged since uh, in, the, in the last couple of weeks is that contrary to what some have argued, which is that SBC, SVB, the Silicon Valley Bank, should have been bailed out because it was some sort of a good bank that it was in, investing in the sort of, the, you know, the, the, the cutting edge of American industry, investing in production, etc. In reality, what we've discovered is that the uh, SVB's banks are much more dubi of much more dubious value, that the federal agency charged with selling and dissolving it cannot find buyers either for the whole of uh, or, or the whole of the bank or banking assets so paul if you wouldn't mind showing the financial times slide please the financial times in this story uh, the next one please the financial times in this story reports that um, the largest portion of the loan book of silicon valley bank were 40, 41.3 billion at the end of 2022, consists primarily of so-called subscription lines, which SVB offered to private equity and venture capital funds. Such loans are extended basically when, you know, to, to, to tide over a, a, a fund when between the time it buys a company uh, or makes an investment and when the fund receives the money that has been promised of which of course there are no guarantees so such loans are always very low yielding they are not even rated and they are now considered too risky by financial institutions that's the bulk of it and then another part of svb's alleged investments amounted to speculation what we may call crony lending lending on a rolling basis to already rich people and their private funds to enrich them so that they can enrich themselves through dividends and management fees, even when they are not making very much money. And the repayment is postponed to the unlikely event that there is a successful IPO. These were the depositors that got bailed out. So honestly, the all is well message is definitely not very credible. In fact, what we are seeing, and of course, we've seen that Powell has repeated the message of Yellen, you know, he said the banking system is sound and resilient and deposits are stable. And he claimed the crisis has been stemmed by the decisive action of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury. But look at this bank of the KBW index, which is a major banking index. Uh, Paul, if you wouldn't mind showing the KBW slide, you see that banks have been sliding over the past month and they remain quite low. They are not recovering. The investors are not assured. The public is not assured. And in this context, it's also very interesting that the Stanford Business School is reporting that the U.S. banking system's market value of assets is $2 trillion lower than suggested by their book value. So this is and, and, and that this has this decline, this this low level. 10%, they have dropped by 10% uh, in the last little while. So this is really quite a, a serious matter. Obviously, this doesn't mean that everybody's going to run to, and, 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 you know, th that these losses will be realized, but it shows you how precarious this, the system is. So the Federal Reserve, uh, in the meantime, remains caught in this pincer movement 
uh, of between monetary stability and financial stability and has therefore produced a compromise of a 25% rate hike. So this is the very difficult and how can you say a, 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 a very troubling situation. So Michael, let's you and I delve right in. We want to really, what we want to talk about today is the unraveling of neoliberal financialization. So for the last two decades, basically, US authorities have acted like the policemen in the Casablanca, uh, in the film Casablanca, the policeman who is shocked to find that there's gambling in the casino. This is this is exactly what's going on. This is what Alan Greenspan did when he uh, when he was testifying about the uh, 2008 crisis. He said, I thought markets worked very well and I was shocked to find out that they are not working well. Ben Bernanke has done the same thing. Every time there's a crisis, the authorities claim to be shocked once again. And the fact of the matter is that we, we simply cannot let, let, let you know, we take them at face value. The fact of the matter is that the U.S. banking system is not just, not only is it not sound today, it has not been a seriously functional banking system since at least the 2000 dot-com crash, if not even earlier than that. When the uh, United States... Uh, a dollar-based financial system made the transition to ultra-low interest rates, chiefly because financial authorities realized that asset markets, the inflation of asset bubbles, particularly the real estate bubble, was the only re thing working in the U.S. economy. So they decided to uh, uh, to to um, uh, to to give give it a full full reign, and so low interest rates were designed to do that. And so this banking system has been failing in its most fundamental function of assessing risk. In fact, it has become based on excessive risk. Well, when you say risk, uh, it's really arbitrage. There was no risk of non-payment in uh, the treasury securities that uh, uh, the bank held. There was not even a risk of non-payment for the mortgages that it held. The risk is uh, simply the fact that interest rates uh, went up. Uh, and the fact that uh, it, for years, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, like all the other banks, only paid depositors about 0.2% on their savings. Any of you who had your money in the bank, there was no way that you could uh, uh, get a higher rate than about 0.2%. Well, uh, the government, the uh, bank thought it was making uh, a profit because uh, here it was uh, paying depositors at little rate and it could get 1.8% on government bonds. Well, this is lower than government bonds uh, really had ever been, uh, so that there was a 100% probability, uh, no risk there, 100% loss in the market price when the uh, Federal Reserve, when Mr. Powell said, we're going to begin to raise the rates. We're going to raise the rates because we need uh, uh, to slow the economy so that wages are going to go down, as we uh, discussed before. Uh, and uh, when the government says it's going to raise the rates, uh, he didn't realize that uh, he would not only be hurting labor, but he would be hurting the banks, because if they have their reserves held at a, 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 a very low interest uh, bearing uh, securities, 1.8%, when rates go up to 4%, uh, uh, obviously, that means that the value of the the uh, old government security, 30-year mortgage, 30-year bond, falls to about 70 cents, maybe 65 cents uh, on the dollar. Well, nobody would have uh, cared about this uh, they, uh, if uh, n deposits hadn't been withdrawn. But uh, because uh, the banks were still only paying 0.2%, anybody could take th their money out of the bank uh, savings account and buy a two-year treasury note that would yield uh, over 4%. So why would they leave the money in the bank? In fact, uh, Americans began to withdraw their money from banks all across the country. And once they withdraw the banks, the banks had to actually raise the money to pay them by selling these bonds that they bought uh, at a uh, at a low yield. And all of a sudden, uh, they had they realized that, wait a minute, what we were carrying on our books as that, uh, worth, worth 100 cents on the dollar is really only worth 70 cents on the dollar. They had to take a big loss because uh, the under the rules of reporting, uh, banks report what they paid for the assets, not what the assets actually work on the market. Because if, if they reported what uh, their assets were really worth, you'd see today that the banks are broke. 
that's why the Treasury has said, we will bail you out. We'll take over the banking system, even though the private banking system has outlived its function, even though uh, the private banking system cannot survive, if interest rates go back to normal, we're going to bail them all, keep uh, bailing them all out. Uh, and that uh, basically is uh, uh, what's happened. So uh, the kind of risk uh, uh, was a result of uh, the Federal Reserve's own policy, and it's a risk that uh, affects the entire banking system today, not just uh, Silicon Valley Bank. So true, Michael. And you know, this also, just to remind you, we, we had a, a show, a, couple, a few shows ago on the right, on, 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 on inflation and what has caused this inflation. And one of the things we pointed out is that the Federal Reserve is not going to be able to continue to raise interest rates, not because it cares about American workers. It would dearly love to raise interest rates in order to crush uh, work the working class, crush their employment uh, prospects, crush their wages, etc. But it cannot because it is so tender hearted, not towards American workers and, and workers elsewhere for that matter, but tender hearted towards the filthy rich in the United States. So the banking system is based on excessive risk, as we've just been saying. It has also been investing not in production, which is what your Economics 101 textbook tells you it should do. Rather, it has been investing in everything else, in real estate, in consumption loans, in government bonds, which, by the way, finance tax cuts and not government investment in anything worthwhile or government spending for that matter in anything worthwhile and in other speculative products including asset-backed securities derivatives and so on well the banks really have been lending for speculation as you point out uh, on on financial securities and making arbitrage grant gains you borrow at a low rate and you buy something yielding uh, a higher rate. Uh, and you make money off asset price inflation. And uh, the Federal Reserve's $9 trillion of quantitative easing has simply uh, been aimed at raising stock prices, bond prices, and real estate prices. And that's how banks uh, have been uh, making their, their money. Uh, the effect on consumption has been to load down households and also industrial corporations with debt. And it's the finance takeovers uh, that use corporate profits to support stock prices. Corporations have been borrowing from the banks simply to buy their own stock. Uh, because their own stock pays dividends that are higher than uh, the low borrowing rates. They've been borrowing even to pay out as dividends, because if you borrow money, you pay it as dividends, that's going to raise the stock price temporarily. Obviously, the uh, loans have to be repaid at a point. And if you have private capital taking over a company like Bed Bath & Beyond, it'll, let, uh, it'll take privatize a company, make a, a loan uh, to the company that it takes over, take that loan uh, and then pay themselves a special dividend for management, leaving the company a bankrupt shell. So you could say that the, the role of the banking system is to bankrupt corporate uh, industry and to uh, lock in the transition from industrial capitalism to finance capitalism. Uh, it, it really it, it's suicide. Exactly. And this kind of finance capitalism essentially is predatory, predatory, uh, essentially upon workers' wages and taxpayers' revenues, because either directly or through government payments, we are paying for, the ordinary people are paying for essentially, uh, like, like, like the banking system has been transformed into a machine that transforms a goodly part of our taxes and a goodly part of our wages into further payments to themselves. So this is what is a predatory banking system. In fact, not only is it predatory, but it also it essentially like tends to strangle the productive part of the economy. Well, I think uh, then we need to define predatory. Uh, and uh, as you said, uh, it basically means unproductive overhead. Uh, uh, on the, the non-financial economy has to bear. Uh, I think a predatory loan is one that does not provide the means to help the debtor repay its, uh, uh, its, its creditor. For instance, uh, credit, uh, people have believed that they're getting rich by borrowing from a bank to buy a house that uh, whose value goes up, but the value of housing going up is because so many people are borrowing that uh, the, uh, the housing is worth whatever a bank will lend, and it's all been bid up on credit. So what's really gone up is the housing debt. 
people say my worth, my uh, uh, house is worth a lot more, but uh, the equity that they have, people have in their houses, has been falling and falling and falling uh, as the uh, the uh, economy has become more debt uh, uh, leveraged. So it's not simply wages and profits uh, that banks want. Uh, what they want is to transform property into financial gains. It's all about capital gains. It's about asset price inflation that they love as opposed to uh, uh, wage inflation. And, and actually, that reminds me, you know, this is really a system that is about profiting without producing. That's what they are on about. So it is also, therefore, very speculative. It's based on inflating asset bubbles, which, of course, has been the result of two decades of what of low interest rates policy, what people call the LERP or low interest rate policy or the ZERP, which is a zero interest rate policy. And the result is that today there is essentially a bubble in practically every asset market. Well, and, and, loans are, yeah, that's what a zero interest policy was all about. They said, uh, we have to reinflate the price of stocks, bonds, and real estate because uh, the banks after 2008 were back then negative equity. Uh, they they couldn't cover uh, their, uh, what they owed depositors. The, the way of saving the bank was to vastly raise the price of housing in the United States and raise the price of buying a retirement income. Yeah. And then in addition, we have seen a couple of other, uh, a few other things as well. We have seen the financialization of productive corporations. I mean, once you create such a vast and powerful financial sector, the few remaining productive corporations that are remaining, they basically throw in the towel. They say, if you can't beat them, join them. So essentially, they also develop financial arms. You've probably heard of the saying that GM makes more money. Uh, lending you money to buy cars than it makes building and selling you cars. So GM Financial is bigger and more powerful than GM itself. So this has been, of course, a trend that has been noticed throughout the present century and even going back a little bit before that. Even Macy's used to make more money by getting uh, credit cards uh, for Macy's customers uh, than they made actually on the store. It's as if the whole objective of corporate uh, industry today is to get consumers to run into debt and make money off the interest that you charge for consumers rather than to make profits. So a uh, economic analysis that focuses on uh, uh, profits made by uh, employers uh, exploiting labor uh, misses the point that uh, there's much more income to be made by uh, financializing uh, than by industrialization. And that's why uh, the uh, people who uh, uh, basically run the economy, uh, uh, the, as a, the management's been shifted from Washington to Wall Street, uh, say, well, the money's to be made in financialization, not industry. And uh, that's why we've been deindustrializing and painted uh, the US economy into the corner that it really can't reindustrialize uh, without replacing the banking system that uh, is in the middle of uh, showing that it doesn't work. No, exactly. And then, you know, we also see that this kind of uh, the, the kind of economy that has now emerged as a result of decades of policies that have encouraged financialization and discouraged production is that we basically have an economy of corporations whose balance sheets don't bear much scrutiny. And that is why you've seen the rise of private equity, which means that you can have corporations that do not have to make their accounts public, that are not kept accountable by any sort of public scrutiny. So the risks here are so great that more and more countries, companies, cannot be listed publicly they have uh, and have their balance sheets scrutinized publicly and therefore all the lending that goes to these outfits again is lending that takes place in the kind of crony lending fashion that we have already discussed and this is the kind of structure that has created the astronomical inequality that we have all noticed in the recent past particularly over the covid period but it goes back a long way in fact when uh, thomas thomas piketty wrote his big fat book on inequality he actually missed a trick because he blamed rising inequality on capitalism alone and i'm not saying capitalism is innocent but this kind of financial capitalism has been primarily responsible for transferring wealth from the ordinary people to a, an extremely small filthy rich elite and in this system, the financial system has been a major aid to this process. Well, most people, when you think of inequality, uh, the way it's uh, shown in the uh, newspapers is uh, they think of inequality of income. 
uh, the wealthy people are making more income. But by far the main source of in inequality is that of wealth. It's on the balance sheet. It's assets and debts. And if you look at wealth, half of Americans have no net worth zero net worth. Uh, so it, 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 compare the zero to the uh, uh, enormous wealth that the one uh, percent has made uh, since uh, 2008 uh, as a result of the asset price inflation. That's where the inequality is. And that's what uh, the aim of uh, uh, ZERP was to inflate uh, the asset market. So people think of prosperity as being when uh, the, uh, the value of their stocks and bonds grow up as, as if, uh, and they pretty much ignored uh, the fact that uh, this is uh, much uh, more uh, overshadowing than uh, just uh, income. There was a, a point in the uh, 1980s and again, uh, much more in the 2000s, where uh, home buy a worker could go take out a mortgage, buy a home, and in one year, the v price of the in home's uh, increase would exceed what the worker could take home during the entire year. Uh, that really, is, imagine how uh, this affects by the fact that the uh, upper 10% own maybe uh, two thirds uh, of the stock market and the bond market. That's where the real source of inequality is. And you have to look at the balance sheet of finance capitalism, not at the dynamics of industrial capitalism that's being uh, replaced by this financialization. You know what you say, Michael, reminds me, if you look at, uh, you know, a lot of us, we, we love to gripe at, you know, how much doctors may make or how much, um, you know, some people, you know, who are employed may make, whereas the rest of people make so little. But the biggest in income, biggest inequalities of income are not between different sections of those who make their money through work. Yes, they are great but they are nothing compared to the differentials of incomes between those who make money through work and those who make money through wealth. And you can see charts about this. This is what it's about. So anyway, so what we are trying to say is that the financial system, even before 2023, even before 2020, even before 2008 was already unsound. And these, and we have simply seen a, 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 a demonstration of the unsoundness of the system. So basically, all of these bubbles that we are seeing, they are now waiting to, they are now waiting to be burst. Because right now, as a result of decades now, almost two decades of low or zero interest rate policy, we today have an everything bubble. Every asset market is uh, is is in a in a bubble situation, and the recent interest rate hikes have been the pin. They have burst. They are bursting the bubble. The prices of assets of all sorts, not just government bonds, which were involved in the SVB collapse, but also derivatives, real estate, commercial real estate. Every form of assets are declining. SVB was invested, of course, in long-term government bonds, and I won't repeat. Michael's already explained very nicely what um, uh, what uh, what went wrong there. But uh, and many progressive thinkers, of course, are, are were arguing that you know the um, Silicon Valley Bank was a good bank providing patient capital and whatnot. But in fact, as Pam and Russ Martins of this wonderful website, Wall Street on Parade, which you should check out if you're interested in these things, as they pointed out, the, the uh, Silicon Valley Bank was basically a pipeline that moved extremely speculative types of investments towards IPOs, many of which, of course, never materialized. But the cost of those and the cost in uh, that cost, including the lavish lifestyles and the Im immense wealth uh, uh, agglomeration of the people involved, were financed by institutions like Silicon Valley Bank. Earlier cryptocurrencies also were going bust. There has been a silent crash in equity and real estate prices and commercial real estate prices, they have all been crashing. Well, what you've described is uh, the, is what was called economic rent uh, in the 19th uh, century. Uh, what used to be the landlord class that was running society is now uh, the financial class. Uh, and uh, they make money uh, basically uh, by what used to be paid as rent. Uh, before, uh, under the, under uh, the old aristocracy uh, that emerged from feudalism, people would pay rent to the landlords, uh, the ground rent. Uh, 
now uh, people uh, now that uh, uh, housing has been democratized, uh, they pay uh, their uh, the rental value is paid to the banks as interest. So instead of being a rentier class based on land rent, we have a rentier class based on interest and on on making money uh, financially in the way that yeah, uh, you said uh, the banks don't make don't uh, lend out their deposits uh, for industrial development. They don't lend them out to build uh, factories or new means of production. They uh, lend them out to buy existing factories and uh, break them up and turn them into gentrified housing uh, uh, to make profit. So uh, it's sort of a travesty of, to compare what's actually happening uh, to what is uh, reported in the uh, uh, in the textbooks. And of course, uh, the, it's very hard to have a huge financial superstructure based without an industrial base. Uh, and if you have a superstructure on a teeny base, at a certain point, it's going to collapse. Uh, and that's finally what we're seeing today. The uh, idea of a post-industrial economy making money purely on financial engineering instead of industrial engineering uh, ends up uh, uh, with uh, more claims for payment than the economy can pay. That's been the theme of all of our uh, our shows, and that's exactly what you're seeing today. Uh, Ponzi schemes work uh, until somebody wants to withdraw their money. And once you said, okay, you say we've been getting rich, uh, now let, uh, you know, we've uh, put all this money into the scheme, let's try to uh, withdraw it. All of a sudden, uh, <laughs> we're told it's not there. You're seeing uh, Mr. Macron in France facing uh, riots when he's trying to say, well, we can't afford to pay Social Security because uh, the banks have uh, needed more money for the bailout, so uh, we're going to extend the retirement age. Uh, I'm waiting for Mr. Biden uh, to go back to his uh, program of uh, uh, a decade ago and say we've got to cut back Social Security, got to cut back uh, Medicare uh, because we've had to use the money for the bank bailout. I'm sorry there's no money, and uh, uh, we're uh, the, now that the Treasury is uh, part of uh, Citibank and Wells Fargo, uh, we have to uh, uh, do first things first. No, this is absolutely, Michael. And so these are this is one set of problems. There's excessive risk, there's this Ponzi character, etc. Now, you'd think that the Federal Reserve and the government exist to keep oversight on this, to ensure that these banks are regulated, that they don't get into trouble. So why do they get into trouble? The reason is because the system is actually riven with what's known as regulatory capture, which is essentially a, 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 a which is essentially a fancy way of saying that you are hiring the fox to guard the chicken coop. The fact of the matter is that the Federal Reserve, which is supposed to regulate, is itself captive of those it is supposed to regulate. Well, the regulators don't regulate. If you look at what's happened to uh, Citibank, Wells Fargo, and Chase, they were told by the regulators, uh, you're on probation. You've broken the rules. Don't break them again. They break them again. Again and again, they, uh, they break them. The Federal Reserve does nothing. Uh, the Federal Reserve of San Francisco sent out warnings to Silicon Valley Bank saying, hey, your uh, balance sheet uh, can't cover your deposits. You're a negative equity. Uh, and... Uh, uh, we're drawing your attention to that. And uh, the reply from Silicon Valley Bank, yep, we're paying attention to it. You know, so what? You know, you watch, uh, you can watch television, you can pay attention to us. Uh, th th there is no regulatory apparatus and no regulatory apparatus can be put in as long as the banks get to nominate the regulators. They they have one of their lawyers go and act as a regulator. And uh, the uh, sometimes the regulators are appointed by Washington, but uh, they're appointed by the uh, heads of the financial committee. And uh, you become a head of the financial committee by uh, contributing money to the, the Democratic or Republican Party uh, leadership. And uh, the uh, the committee head headships are sold off for who raises the most money. So all the banks have to do is give their lobbyists uh, enough money to buy the position as head of the financial and banking committee so that they can appoint regulators from the banking system. Uh, as long as, as you have uh, the, uh, uh, the Citizens United uh, rule of uh, essentially putting pol politics up for sale, uh, the banks are going to take over uh, the, the regulation. So again, what's happened is that uh, instead of the banks being nationalized, uh, the treasury has been privatized. 
uh, by the uh, by the uh, uh, by the banking system, and uh, that is sort of the ultimate uh, victory of finance capitalism. Uh, but the result is that it'll destroy industrialization and what used to be industrial capitalism in the United States. Exactly, indeed, uh, Michael. As your new book is going to argue, it is going to destroy civilization itself. Paul, maybe we might just see Michael a cover of Michael's new book. That would be great. <laughs> Um, Thank yeah, you. This collapse of antiquity, uh, Michael traces the whole history of the current patterns of financialization back into antiquity and connects it indeed with the collapse of antiquity. So do check it out. It should be available on Amazon now. But to return to, to our point now, you know, Michael, what you say actually reminds me so much of the, uh, the famous novel, Lord of the Flies, because again, you know, when you think about the regulators, um, the reg, you know, the idea is that there are regulators and they regulate the, the banks. So there are some adults in the room that are going to make sure nothing goes wrong. But actually, there are no adults in the room. Everybody is the one of the kids who is essentially going to egg the other kids on into ever greater disaster. And that's what we are seeing. And so, you know, there is a long history of regulatory capture. And let me just reel off some of the major moments in this. So the Federal Reserve was colluding in the deregul has been colluding in deregulation since the 1990s. And in what we may call the original sin of this financial system, which was the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act, which divided banking into investment banking and commercial banking and provided deposit insurance only to commercial banking, which it then proceeded to regulate fairly heavily. Investment banking could do whatever it liked, but whatever losses it made, that was it was losing money on its own dime. Nobody was going to go and help it. But the repeal of Glass-Steagall essentially has muddied all the waters and it has allowed the Federal Reserve to step in and say, OK, we can bail everybody out, etc. And the repeal of Glass-Steagall, the way it happened is also very interesting because Citicorp merged with Travelers Group, an investment bank with insurance interests, to create Citigroup. And this challenged the Glass-Steagall boundaries, the red lines that were drawn between investment banking, commercial banking, insurance, etc. So the situation this produced was that either they had to comply, that is to say, break up parts of the and, 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 and sell off parts of the uh, merged banks so that they would once again be compliant with Glass-Steagall within a year or two, or Glass-Steagall had to be repealed. And now get this, the regulator, Alan Greenspan, bet that the industry would get to do whatever they like and the regulation would be defeated and he won. And the repeal of Glass-Steagall in 1999 has undoubtedly laid the basis of the 2008 bubble and today's multiple bubbles and everything that has happened, the quantitative easing, the ZERPs, the LERPs, everything. Well, that's right. You, you remember uh, uh, when Drexel Burnham went under uh, in the 1980s, uh, it didn't matter. There was no crisis of the banking system. Uh, uh, the uh, customers of uh, Drexel did pretty much. The stockholders were wiped out. The Fed didn't say there's a big crisis. But then once you had the, uh, the, uh, the uh, brokerage companies merge with the banking companies, the brokerage companies took over the banks. It was the brokery, it was the financial uh, speculative part of Citibank that took over. It was a, it was the uh, this all the banks bought brokerage companies, and essentially uh, you had the transition from uh, old uh, fashioned banking of just lending out money to uh, stock market speculation, and that uh, the result yeah. is that. Uh, uh, you, you have the situation you have today that uh, that's why Moody's ended up downgrading the entire banking system because it's not it's uh, now it's all a stock market speculation. Basically, it's exactly. not a, a banking system. And, and yeah, and just to reel off a few other such instances, the Federal Reserve's a concealment of the real extent of the bailout of 2008 is also very interesting. This is generally confused with the Trouble Asset Release Program, the TARP, which was actually quite modest, like it was $750 billion. And many then, they realize this is the case, and then they then put the extent of the real bailout, which was essentially Federal Reserve money printing, at $7 trillion. However, 
uh, economists at the Levy Institute have in the last few years actually tallied, if you put together all the different emergency programs that were rolled out by the Federal Reserve in the aftermath of 2008, it amounts to 29 get this $29 trillion. So if you just Google the words 29 trillion, I'm sure you'll find the relevant paper. There was also the Federal Reserve policy reversal after the 2015 taper tantrum. That is to say when the Federal Reserve decided that it was going to tighten up monetary policy a little bit, stop the stop doing quantitative easing and do a little bit of quantitative tightening, the market had a tantrum and the Federal Reserve essentially capitulated to it. There was the Trump era loosening of regulation that was already under the already weak Dodd-Frank Act because the Dodd-Frank was supposed to be a replacement for Glass-Steagall, but it was nowhere near that. And even that was weakened. And by the way, in this weakening, the uh, Silicon Valley Bank's CEO, Gary Becker, played a major role. Further, there was a concealment of the 2019 bailout of the repo market, the market in which banks borrow overnight from each other. There was a big crisis in that. Interest rates were going up. We don't fully know what happened yet. Uh, Wall Street on parade once again has exposed this, but we are, uh, uh, you know, this still remains to be found out exactly what happened. There was the 2020 Federal Reserve trading scandal in which Federal Reserve governors used insider information about who, which banks was going to profit from which bailouts and use this in trading, which was also extensively reported. There was a Federal Reserve bailout of 2020 itself, which was now extended to productive corporations, not because the Federal Reserve cares about productive corporations, but because these productive corporations and the assets that they created for the financial system were very important for the financial system. And finally, there was the what the, uh, the Federal Reserve doing everything possible to create and maintain the unsound structure of the U.S. banking today. If you, if what you see as the U.S. financial system is actually the Federal Reserve's baby, and this is the one that has been downgraded by Moody from stable to negative. The entire U.S. banking system, which prides itself on being the most advanced and sophisticated financial system in the world. So decades of these practices have now come home to roost as interest rates are going up and created the classic dilemma between maintaining monetary stability, that is to say curbing inflation, and maintaining uh, 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 maintaining um, financial stability. The Federal Reserve cannot uh, is caught between these two uh, uh, demands, and it cannot achieve both of them at the same time. And that is why the Federal Reserve has opted for a 0.25% increase so that it looks like it's still combating inflation. But in this uh, increase, combined with its backstops, somehow tries to save the financial system from its most, from its own misdemeanors. So this is the point at which uh, Yellen has stopped a more pervasive run on the banks by announcing that, uh, uh, you know, uh, there will be money for, you know, systemic, uh, systemically important banks, etc. Um, but here she's also caught given the, the anger that people still feel at the bailout of 2008. She cannot be shown to be using taxpayers' money in order to bail them out. So, what is to be done? There are a number of other measures that have been proposed. One of them is simply to, to let the markets do their work. If, if the banking sector is, if banks are going to collapse, let them collapse. Let there be no bailouts. Um, so well, that, mean, th that means taking them over. Uh, and uh, you had that, I guess, with Continental Illinois Bank. If taking them over, that how is the government going to run them? Is it going to take them over and say, OK, uh, your uh, way of doing business hasn't worked out. We're now going to be run it, running it as a public bank, as a state bank, uh, making loans for purposes that uh, uh, banks used to be supposed to be making for uh, sound uh, mortgage loans, not for speculative purposes. Or are they just going to take them over and then say, well, here's a weak bank. Let's sell it to Chase Manhattan or Citibank. Let's sell the weak banks to the strong banks uh, so that we'll end up with maybe five banks in America like Canada has. Uh, uh, what is the government going to do 
when it folds up a bank. Uh, the pressure is that uh, they're going to just give them to the big banks and essentially uh, the big banks will end up running into the same problems that uh, led the small banks over and uh, the government will be paying. Not with taxpayer money, it'll just uh, create the money to do that. Yes, I mean, I think, though, that, you know, of course, uh, Michael, what you're saying is probably what will li is likely to happen. But I should say that the people who are suggesting this are not suggesting what they are, you are saying. They are suggesting that the banks should be allowed to fail because not allowing banks to fail has created moral hazard. Now, I agree with you. This will not ha this will not happen chiefly because of the problem we've already talked about, which is regulatory capture. The financial sector will not stand for it, and the Federal Reserve and the alleged regulators will do exactly their bidding, which is that if they become unviable, then they will be bailed out. But that is one you know, one point that is that is being made. And by the way, I should add that you know you um you refer to too too big to fail. Too big to fail was first used as a uh, as a principle to bail out a bank when Continental Illinois went bust in, in 1984, thanks to its exposure to a lot of uh, uh, third world debt in particular. And that was the first time it was used, although then it remained quite episodic. But today it has become much more systemic. Anyway, the second proposal that has been made is that you that all bank deposits should be covered under the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, there are two problems with this. Number one, there are many Republicans who will oppose this and the Biden administration is not going to be able to pass the relevant legislation if they are a sufficiently sizable number. But what's more, they will also require extending uh, uh, insurance premium, increasing insurance premium that the banks will have to pay if they are going to, the bank, the financial sector is going to have to collectively pay for its own failures. And this will be resisted by the financial sector itself. Of course, there are other more severe options. You know, uh, uh, people have said increase uh, reserves, decrease leverage, convert debt into equity, especially if bank shares sink below a certain point. Some of the debt becomes equity, which means that people who have invested in this will stand to lose money. They have also proposed you should strictly enforce mark to market accounting penalize the management of failed banks. So these there are many such proposals, but all of these will in one way or another be resisted by the financial sector itself. Well, Martin Wolf has suggested uh, moving from a three to one leverage uh, uh, ratio uh, instead of uh, from a, a 10 to 20 to one uh, uh, ratio now common. In other words, the banks shouldn't be able to make uh, uh, such uh, high uh, loan to value. Uh, loans. That would hold it in. And he's also mentioned uh, the Chicago plan, uh, basically turning uh, uh, the, the banks into savings banks, which is wh what they were originally uh, imagined out to be. Uh, they won't create credit, take away their ability to create credit because they, they've stopped creating credit for uh, useful public purposes. Uh, the 100% uh, reserves, they can lend out the deposits they have. And if they uh, have a uh, opportunity to make more loans, either uh, mortgage loans uh, under uh, non-leveraged uh, rules or uh, to actually back uh, construction or uh, new means of production, then uh, the treasury will provide them uh, with the deposits uh, to lend out. In effect, the treasury would be doing what uh, it's it's supposed to be do doing under Yeltsin, but not in her under Yellen, uh, not in her uh, perverted way. Uh, it will be uh, extending credit for banks to make productive loans, not unproductive loans. That was the Chicago plan, ironically developed by the University of Chicago in the 1930s, uh, and the the commercial banks would act uh, essentially uh, as they were supposed to in the textbooks, deciding what kind of loans help the economy, what kind of loans are productive, and most of all, uh, what kind of loans can the debtor afford to pay back? And can the economy afford to pay back without slowing the economy and bringing on a depression that prevents the loans from being paid? 
No, and this is exactly the sort of return to plain vanilla banking that the financial system as it is today will never stand for because they have become used to essentially being allowed to create as much credit as they want in order to engage in leverage speculation, borrow money to throw into speculation so that you can make much more money on the same margins, etc. So this is going to also be resisted. But nevertheless, you can see you can see the seriousness of the crisis by the radicalism of the proposals being made even by quite mainstream writers. So people have said you should also, according to the Chicago plan, that there should be a separation of the issuance of money from the issuance of credit. Central banks essentially would become, uh, uh, would issue central bank digital currencies. So that, that would mean that all of us would have money issued by the central bank and we would have accounts with the central bank. And then Whatever private financial banks remain, I mean, in a certain sense, there need in this scenario be no private financial sector. But if any financial sec private financial sector remains, it could only lend against extremely high reserves, which would reduce their profitability. So this would again transform uh, the financial sector into a public utility and not the casino that it currently is. Well, th that's the, really the key. Uh, who is going to create money, uh, the government or the banks? The banks have shown that their bank credit uh, has not uh, ended up in a functional way. It's become defunctional. And the losses for the U.S. and the European banking systems already are in the trillions of dollars. Uh, and that's even before the bad gambles on derivatives uh, are taken into account. Uh, and we don't even have a, uh, know how much uh, that would be. So if the Treasury does not take over the banking system's deposit liabilities, then this whole week's banking crisis uh, is economy-wide uh, and is, is permanent. It cannot be fixed because of the mathematics of compound interest. Uh, any interest rate uh, uh, doubles in time, and any the, as long as the, uh, the interest rates rise again, you're going to have debts double and redouble and redouble and the economy it will not keep place the economy will be shrinking and shrinking and you'll have an even bigger pyramid of credit and debt uh, they're the same uh, thing uh, on a smaller and smaller industrial base this is indeed michael the logic of the system and we totally agree on that however there are as i say deep contradictions in this because what we are looking at is a financial system which is presided over by authorities who can be relied on if their past behavior is any 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 indication they can be relied on to fight tooth and nail to keep the system private even though even as crisis after crisis its public character becomes manifest and they will keep it not only private but private and only in the private and the most minimally regulated so what we are going to witness uh, are further strenuous efforts to keep interest rates low to continue bailing out banks not necessarily with taxpayers money this may not be possible anymore although they will try but certainly with federal reserve created money which again will not be put to the use of the productive economy to create broad-based prosperity, but to keep the wealth of the rich secure. They will continue to surrender to financial sector demands not to be regulated on the one hand, and while on the other hand, to be bailed out from the consequences of their unregulated and deregulated activities. And there will be in the process of all this a continuous flow of rhetoric about the need for freedom and how the private sector only is innovative and so on. So this is the pattern uh, of how the rubble will now con will bounce further because we have had lots of rubble before and, well, bounce, and there it is. Yeah. Sorry, well, the International Monetary Fund reports that this condition already is the case with uh, many of the Global South debts. Uh, now that the dollar has ridden, risen above their currencies and their trade deficits in energy and food are exploding uh, as a result of the U.S. sanctions against Russia, uh, within the, uh, uh, you're having the same system uh, within the U.S. economy, although I think you can recognize it more clearly uh, with, the global, with uh, uh, Argentina and Latin America and uh, uh, other countries. Within the U.S. economy, the Federal Reserve 
cannot escape from Obama's zero interest rate policy without creating such large losses for the banking system's reserves and assets and loan values that the entire system is insolvent. Uh, you've already seen uh, the little bit that uh, the Fed has raised interest rates. You've seen what it did to Sil Silicon Valley Bank and the, uh, the entire banking system, which is why it was downgraded. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a quandary that uh, it cannot be solved without a transformation of the whole structure of banking. And uh, that requires how people think about money and credit, uh, which we're talking about now. No, and you know, your mention or your, 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 you put, as a lot of people do, put Credit Suisse and, and uh, Silicon Valley Bank in the same box. And I, I, I do feel that in one way they belong in the same box, but it's also very interesting someday, Michael, in another program to look at the historical differences between the US and America uh, and, and British banking systems on the one hand and the continental banking systems on the other. And e which differences which persist to this day and which are interesting today because I think the cookie will crumble in a different way across the across the Atlantic. I think that they will have problems, but I think that anyway, it'll be interesting to see how what happens with Credit Suisse, with Deutsche Bank, etc. But I also wanted to point out that, you know, uh, Paul, if you would just show the interest rates charts, I think, you know, a lot of people say uh, they, they, they attribute the current crisis to the uh, lowering of interest rates. Uh, in the pandemic, which is what you see just here after 2020. But in fact, I would say that uh, the uh, the US financial system entered the era of low interest rates as early as 2000, except in the middle of the decade, Greenspan was forced to raise interest rates because of the downward pressure that was created on the dollar, uh, particularly with rising commodity prices. And of course, it only had to reach about 5% before it triggered the 2008 financial crisis. And then, of course, we saw them come right down to, to zero until uh, and then going up slightly in the recent past. Uh, and then once again, having to be brought down with the with the pandemic and going up. So really, for most of the 2020s, as you see, we have had compared to the past a historically low level of interest rates. Well, you had the dot-com bubble uh, just before 2000, and that led Greenspan uh, to lower the interest rates. That was temporary. Uh, the real quantitative easing took place uh, on, uh, with the uh, Obama depression begin. Ever since uh, Obama bailed out the banks and not the economy, ever since he uh, didn't write down the, uh, the debts to what can be paid, ever since he refused to let uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation take over Citibank and refused to uh, declare that the largest banks, uh, uh, Wells Fargo, uh, Chase, all these banks were insolvent, that refusal led to uh, the, uh, the whole uh, debt uh, overhead and what they called the jobless recovery. They still pretended it was a recovery, but they, in, instead of calling it a jobless depression, which is what a depression <laughs> right. is, they called it jobless a recovery. So it's like the depression recovery. Uh, that was a deliberate policy uh, choice of Obama and his uh, uh, Treasury Secretary, Geithner. That, was the, that remains the policy of the Democratic Party today with a re some Republican uh, support. Uh, their policy is to put the, the financial sector first, and the job of the entire economy is to uh, reduce its living standards, cut back its corporate investment, cut back any spending uh, except the flow of money into uh, the financial sector. That sounds radical. Uh, but that's exactly uh, what, what's uh, uh, been happening by the banks. And it's the inherent tendency of the, it's the mathematics of uh, interest bearing debt and finance themselves. No, absolutely. I, I should just clarify that the reason why I still think that the, the early, the low interest rate policy in the early 2000s is continuous with what we have seen since is that you see, Back then, uh, uh, Greenspan lowered interest rates uh, in, 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 the, in the first instance, yes, in response to the dot-com crash. But then 
they kept it going because they realized that the only thing that was keeping the the only really uh, sort of motor in the US economy that was chugging along at any rate was the already brewing real estate bubble. And in order to keep that going, that because that was the only thing that was really working in the US economy because it was inflating asset values and so on. So that that is the main reason. But but beyond that, I agree. I mean, definitely these policies have taken a new on a new scale and intensity since since 2008. Well, something happened way beyond interest rates. Uh, uh, the the collapse of uh, 2008 wasn't simply uh, a, a product of lowering interest rates. It was fraud. There were 8 million uh, defaulting mortgage victims uh, that were, it were uh, thrown out of their houses. Eight, uh, the houses of 8 million American families were bought out by private capital companies and turned from owner-occupied housing into rental housing. The shape of the economy changed. This is much more than lower interest rates. Uh, it was a, a transformation of uh, uh, the American economy from a homeowner's economy to uh, a rental economy, from an industrial economy to a financial economy. It was really so uh, the Obama administration uh, ended permanently the uh, any hopes for an American industrial takeoff until such time as uh, uh, his uh, acts can be undone and you wipe out uh, the debt overhead that is uh, the, the same thing as the savings overhead uh, of the banks and the financial sector. As long as America uh, bails out the uh, financial sector, uh, it's bailing out the wealth of the 1%. Uh, maybe the 10%, uh, but the wealth of the 10% is made by indebting the 90%. And uh, if you indebt the 20, the 90%, there's not going to be any internal market to buy the results of uh, uh, what labor uh, produces. And you're going to have the kind of unemployment that uh, uh, the Federal Reserve says is its uh, policy to restore normalcy. With normalcy, meaning uh, all the wealth ends up uh, in the financial sector, and we're back into uh, something that looks very much like neo-feudalism. No, exactly. And uh, by the way, Michael, again, let me agree with you, first of all, that, you know, Obama was doing this even though everybody and their dog was talking about the need to have a fiscal stimulus, which meant a bigger government role in making the economy more productive, investing, etc. So there's no doubt, although I should also say that the voices that have been talking about that also go back to the 1980s. I mean, remember Ross Perot and him saying that, look, if the United States wants to um, wants to have an economy as competitive as Japan's, it's going to need industrial policy. And that implies a very different financial system. Anyway, and, and so, yes, of course, with Obama continuing these sorts of uh, uh, with these sorts of instincts of the U.S. ruling class, essentially what you have is that uh, uh, you have financial markets prospering against the background of the, an ailing economy, something that we saw taking an extremely grotesque form, particularly during the pandemic when the economy had crashed. And nevertheless, financial markets, particularly after the Federal Reserve's massive stimulus, were simply scaling ever new heights. Well, Obama did something much worse. The Federal Reserve in 2009 started the practice of actually paying interest on bank reserves held at the Fed. So a bank could borrow uh, from the Fed at a low uh, rate of interest, redeposit the money at the Fed and actually make an arbitrage gain. This is, a, again, a transformation in the structure, not a lower interest rate. It's just not just that. It's a lowering interest rate in a way that gives banks a way to make free money by borrowing cheap from the government and lending back to the government. This was a gigantic nine trillion dollar subsidy to the banks at the same time that uh, uh the democrats said we cannot afford to pay uh to forgive student uh debt we can afford to give the debt of the uh one percent we can afford to give the debts of the uh the banks that have gone under uh but not uh, the students not the homeowners that couldn't pay not the uh, victims of uh uh, junk uh, mortgage loans. Uh, this is the choice that the uh, both the Democrats and the Republicans are following, and that is what makes a recovery 
impossible for the United States without uh, a, a change in policy that I don't see how can occur uh, without uh, uh, a, a revolution. Uh, the banks made no attempt to attract deposits. They didn't have to uh, with the Federal Reserve just uh, uh, funding them, uh, much more than just an interest rate policy. Although, although I should say that the practice uh, of pay of the Federal Reserve paying banks interest on their deposit, which previously they had to deposits as part of the regulatory structure, this practice actually began with the 2006 Financial Services Regulatory Relief Act. And this only goes to show that I think that the practices we're talking about are not post-2008. They go back much earlier. Indeed, they go back to before 2008, before 2000, and even back to the deregulatory, deregulatory trends that sets in already by the late 1970s. Well, you could say it goes back to the founding of the Federal Reserve. That was the fatal, uh, the fatal detour that the American economy took. Uh, the uh, if you read uh, the government reports of the National Monetary Commission at the time, the purpose of the Federal Reserve was to take monetary power out of Washington and put it in the financial centers uh, in New York, Philadelphia. And Boston and the Federal Reserve, the government, uh, the Treasury was not even allowed as a board member on the Federal Reserve. Uh, the idea was to privatize finance and essentially uh, replace the Treasury with uh, the private banking system. And uh, uh, one result was the stock market crash of 2000, uh, 1929, uh, and then finally the uh, uh, moratoriums of. Uh, 1931 uh, that you you had, and then finally uh, Roosevelt trying to fix it up. And uh, ever since Roosevelt, uh, the fight has been led by the Democratic Party to uh, undo uh, everything, uh, the reforms that he tried to do. And we're now uh, really back to uh, uh, the the raw uh, banking and raw uh, privatizations that you had uh, already uh, under Wilson in uh, 1914. I think we'd have to do a whole program on the Federal Reserve. But I, I would yeah. simply say, I think that the United States was certainly overdue for creating a central bank. The problem was that they created the particular type of central bank that they did, privately owned and, and, and designed in certain ways and so on. And that I totally agree with. <clears throat> Well, so uh, right now, what do we have? We have uh, an economy slowed down. Uh, the function of the central bank today isn't to, to provide money to the economy. It's to provide money for the banks to make money financially at the economy's expense. Absolutely. I agree with that. And it's also important to underline that what is not invested is consumed. And a lot of people were getting into debt just to make ends meet, to buy the homes and the cars they needed, not for speculation. So, you know, I think it's important to understand that the consumption part is there for two systematic reasons. But yeah. Well, what's not invested isn't necessarily at the expense of consumption. What's not invested is paid out as interest and financial charges to the financial sector. Uh, you don't have cap uh, industrial capital investment in means of production and factories and machinery and research and development. Uh, you have borrowing to make money uh, financially. Uh, so that the Fed's mandate uh, in practice is uh, the reverse of helping ensure full employment. The mandate of the Fed is to make sure that there's enough unemployment that wages cannot rise uh, so that all the growth in economic uh, uh, surplus will uh, accrue to the uh, 1% to 10% that controls the finance, insurance, and real estate sector. The, the whole idea after the pandemic was there was a thought that there would be a recovery. And the idea was uh, you don't, uh, the Federal Reserve said, we don't want the economy to recover if wages are going to go up. Uh, we want the recovery to be uh, a, a jobless recovery, like uh, the Obama recovery uh, was. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, any recovery is in corporate profits, in stock prices, in uh, bond prices, and real estate prices, not in uh, living standards. Uh, and the result was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Michael. And and, and I think that what, uh, what becomes really clear is that th there's no doubt that the Federal Reserve is out 
to cool down the labor market. That is to say, to uh, ensure that there is sufficient unemployment, that labor does not become particularly strong, either economically or politically. However, those who are making this argument tend to um, say that this is a wrong thing to do. Raising, therefore, raising interest rates is the wrong thing to do because inflation is episodic. It's because of food and energy prices and the sanctions and the war and so on and rising monopoly power both of which are true. I'm not at all saying that inflation, these are not important factors in inflation. But Paul, if you might show the inflation chart, I would say that inflation also has one other core component. So you can see here the all items, the food component, the energy component, and then all items, less food and energy. And you can see that that green bar at the end is also quite solid. This is for February figures here. So this is core inflation and core inflation has remained high. And I would say that this core inflation arises from precisely the those fundamental productive weaknesses of the U.S. economy, which have built up over decades, which we have been talking about, Michael, right, throughout this episode and many others, particularly in several decades. And this is, yeah, and this is not budging. Sorry, go ahead. I think it's more financialized. Uh, the uh, the uh, Much of that inflation, the largest element is the 20% rise in housing costs. That's the financial uh, uh, consequence of uh, uh, banks uh, raising the price of housing and shifting uh, into a, uh, a rentier economy. The rise in energy prices, which is the largest uh, element in the bar chart you chose, is a result of the American sanctions uh, against Russia. And as Biden said, uh, the, uh, we have the sanctions against Russia and of blocking its energy and its food and grain uh, because this is a, uh, a 10 to 20 year uh, fight to prevent any government from playing an active role in the economy. We, uh, China is a mixed economy, private and, and public. Uh, any country that uh, retains a strong government power instead of uh, letting the economy be run by the financial sector is by definition an autocracy, uh, limiting the freedom of the banks uh, to take over. Uh, that's why we're fighting uh, uh, China and why we're fighting Russia as the defender of China. Uh, and uh, when you you just talked about raising the interest rates, uh, people have been criticizing uh, Silicon Valley banks saying, well, why couldn't they simply hedge uh, against uh, interest rates? Well, if you have the head of the Federal Reserve, Mr. Powell, saying we're going to raise interest rates up uh, to uh, uh, 4% from uh, uh, the uh, 0.2% uh, uh, that they were at, that means that every uh, government security, every mortgage, every bond and stock is going to go down in price. In order, who on earth would be at the other side of a hedge? Uh, who on earth would say, well, we promised to pay you in five years uh, to buy this uh, government uh, uh, bond at 100 cents on the dollar, even though the Fed says they're only going to be worth 70 cents on the dollar. Nobody would write a hedge. The hedge would have cost $9 trillion for the economy as a whole, because that was how much uh, was paid. So if the uh, Janet Yellen now says, well, the Treasury will make good uh, uh, all of the bank's losses that have been uh, a, a result of raising interest rates from uh, Obama's uh, uh, you know, the zero interest rate, then there'll have to be another $9 trillion. Well, with $9 trillion, you can forget Social Security, forget Medicare, forget social spending. You'll only have a government doing military spending and uh, uh, paying money to the banks. And the military spending is going to prevent any other country from trying to take over its banking system uh, in the way that uh, China has done. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the the Silicon Valley Bank, as you say, you know, you it, they 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 couldn't have easily hedged themselves against the problems that they found themselves in. But there is also the fact that they probably blithely assumed that they would be bailed out. This was what yeah. they were trying to achieve all along. Um, I, I should also say one other thing. You know, you, earlier you were referring to the fact that the Federal Reserve has this dual mandate, and of course. Uh, you are quite right. Not only are you right that it never really respects its mandate to keep employment levels high. It is only concerned about its mandate to keep inflation levels low. This uh, second mandate of keeping employment levels high was actually written into the legislation in 1977. But as you know, within less than a year or two of the legislation passing, 
Paul Volcker, by imposing his interest rate shock, violated that employment mandate right royally. So you know that the Federal Reserve only uses it to justify policies whose real purpose is to be soft towards the financial sector. And in they, th these policies are then justified in the name of keeping employment levels high. Well, I, I don't think that uh, uh, the Silicon Valley Bank actually expected to have to be bailed out. What it expected was that deposits would continue to grow and uh, somehow the financial system would work and uh, it would just hold the treasury bonds yielding a very low rate and it could afford to, to do that as long as it was making a lot of money elsewhere. Uh, in the economy, but it never expected depositors to actually withdraw the money. The idea was that uh, deposits would grow uh, forever, but one, uh, once uh, finally uh, the banks got so selfish, so greedy, that even though anybody could make 4% by lending to the treasury, the deposits thought, well, people are very uh, lazy, they're slow, they're willing to leave their money here at 0.2% and let us make all the money by uh, uh, paying them 0.2 and uh, ending up uh, earning 4% ourselves. That we'll make enough money so it doesn't matter that we're losing money on our treasury securities. Uh, the public really doesn't have uh, uh, enough sophistication to know that it has a choice. Uh, and once people begin to realize they had a choice, the whole system fell apart, that it didn't have to be this way. And uh, that is what uh, is terrifying uh, the Federal Reserve and the Treasury now, that it doesn't have to be this way. And that if there's a choice, uh, we don't have to let a predatory banking system uh, shape the economy. The economy can make the uh, banking, the money creation system work for the economy instead of vice versa. Well, as you know, every time there's a big disaster, there's always the, the question always arises, are the people responsible fools or knaves? Michael, you're saying that they were fools. I'm saying they're knaves, but who knows the situation might, they may be both. But this also actually raises a really interesting question in my mind. Like as I've been following the story of the Silicon Valley Bank, I read that uh, the initial alarm about the deposits not being safe was spread by a relatively small number of depositors, including Peter T who is the, you know, the Silicon Valley investor, etc. And, you know, perhaps in the future, we will discover why they did so. Maybe they did it because they thought, OK, let's accelerate this process and make sure that the Federal Reserve comes in and ensures our deposits, etc., etc. So who knows? It will be interesting to find out. Well, I think they were worried about uh, an element of the uh, uh, the uh, act that was passed uh, out uh, a few years ago about bail-ins, uh, saying that if uh, banks couldn't pay, uh, the, there was going to be a bail-in. The depositors, uh, over 250,000, uh, would have their deposits cut back to make up for the bank's losses. Well, there was no, that's the, uh, I'm blocking the name of the act right now, uh, but that was uh, completely unnecessary necessary because if the banks would have, if government would have taken over the banks, exactly the same thing would have happened. Of course, they would have parceled out uh, what was left of the uh, banks uh, among the uh, various depositors. So uh, the uh, the depositors in Silicon Valley, uh, because there were so few of them uh, who were depositors at the bank, uh, this was a very concentrated bank ownership, said, well, we don't want to be left holding the bag and bailed in. Uh, let's, uh, let's uh, jump ship. Uh, right now and uh, 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 leave the bank a shell. After all, that's our business model. We start companies, uh, we, uh, we, we sell them to the public, uh, we, we loot them, we leave them as a corporate shell. Let's do the same thing with Silicon Valley Bank. That's what we know how to do. Yeah, Michael, I think we should probably wind down now. And you wanted to wind down by talking about whether we really need banking. Yes, that's really the question. Uh, if banking doesn't help the economy, uh, what uh, what is uh, the purpose? Uh, uh, certainly, we need a source of credit. Every economy needs credit. Uh, but the credit is supposed to be given for something that is economically productive, uh, to build factories, to build uh, houses, uh, for construction, uh, for infrastructure. And uh, that's not uh, what's happening today. Uh, the, the most credit is for financial speculation, not to finance productive capital investment. And uh, 
the default rates are rising all across the board. Mortgage loans are defaulting, auto loans are defaulting, credit card debt is defaulting, uh, and nobody knows how large the uh, losses on derivative gambles are. Uh, so uh, the, the question is, if the, uh, if the way that we structure banks today leads to bankruptcy of the banks and it needs to bail out, uh, why not uh, have uh, the Treasury uh, create uh, public banks and uh, uh, simply uh, fun, uh, fund the economy for public purposes instead of letting the uh, financial sector uh, not only take over the banking system, but take over the treasury itself uh, and even take over the government as uh, you're having under the uh, Citizens United and uh, what's happening today. Are we going to have finance capitalism or are we going to go back to industrial capitalism evolving into socialism? I thought they had already taken over, Michael. I thought that was what yeah. we were arguing. Isn't that so? But anyway, I mean, I think that, you know, certainly I think this is the central contradiction. And I think that the Federal Reserve's actions will, on the one hand, be pulled by this reality to which Michael and I have been referring to, which is a reality of the public character of banking. Banking needs to be public. But on the other hand, the other side, will there will be another pull as well in the opposite direction, which is the desire of the regulators to pretend as though they are still running a private system which is inherently virtuous. So Michael, and then the other thing you say about, you know, essentially wouldn't it be cheaper and more direct for the treasury uh, to create a national bank? Well, that would be a, a bank, a central bank issuing what is increasingly being talked about in progressive circles, issuing a central bank digital currency, which will allow every citizen to have a uh, account with the uh, with the central bank. You don't actually need any other banks. You know, in the past, you needed banks and bank branches because there was no way in which a central bank sitting in New York or Washington or wherever could reach out to the entire country. But today, with information technology, that is no longer an obstacle. So I think that makes central bank digital currencies more possible. It then evades the necessity of having these private casinos, which we call our financial system today. And it also then can make more feasible a financial system that is oriented towards serving a productive, broadly productive economy that creates broad based prosperity. So I think that we should also at some point talk about this soon. And, and you see, the other thing that's perhaps really interesting that we should kind of kind of remember is that this that, that the United States and most other countries had a financial system much closer to a productive financial system in the decades after the Second World War, which is why back then you didn't have the same rate of financial failure and nor did you have the same levels of inequality, speculation, predation. So, Paul, if we can see the first of the two bank failures charts, it's really quite interesting what you see here. So this is the first chart. And what you see is from the uh, 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 from the beginning, from the since the creation uh, of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation in the 1930s, you see a reduction. The regulation reduces uh, a bank uh, 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 failures. And then you see here these two big bars which show the big SLN uh, save and loans crisis in the 80s and 90s. So that was a very big bank, big, big number of bank failures. And then you see again bank failures increasing. But the actual reality of this is revealed when you combine this chart with the next chart. Paul, if you might, wouldn't mind showing that. Here you see the total deposits that are lost because what also happens in this period, particularly after the 1980s and 1990s and into the 2000s, is a massive centralization of the banking sector so the, the number of deposits that were lost in the uh, in, in in these are actually the highest in the 2000s this is the 2008 financial crisis and now we are seeing more bank failures and more deposits being lost etc here so that you can see that the lack of whereas in the 50s 60s uh, and 70s right through this time there were actually essentially no big bank failures to speak of so this is this is it so so essentially uh, 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 th th this is a situation we need a more highly regulated banking system that is going to be aimed towards creating a, not only making productive investment and creating the sort of economy capable of creating broad-based prosperity
Well, I just want to make, I think the point that you wanted me to make before is uh, we can't restructure the uh, banking and credit system and leave uh, the current bailouts in place and the current debts in place. The enormous amount of uh, debts that have grown uh, as a result of the Obama bailouts, the uh, huge nine trillion in debts cannot uh, remain in the economy uh, without, uh, and the economy can still develop. Uh, this whole buildup of debt sponsored by zero interest rate policy has to be wiped out. Uh, if you keep that debt, if you don't uh, let the banks go under, if you do not uh, wipe out this debt, uh, there is no way that the economy can afford to be competitive in other countries. And all it will be left to, to relate uh, to the international economy will be military power. There's no way that it'll have export power or even a financial power that is viable. Uh, absolutely, Michael. So uh, that, folks, is the story of the banking system that Michael and I wanted to share with you today. It's um, and, and, and really, the answer to this is not only, I think the progressive economists are right to point out to the dangers, the, the anti-labor character of the interest rate increases. But while interest rate increases have to be stopped, that is not the end of it. There has to be a root and branch reform of the financial system. Only that is going to uh, solve the dilemma which we are in today. Now, just a brief word about the, our future shows. So uh, we are going to take a, a break for the next fortnight. So you'll see our next show in about a month's time. Uh, the reason we're taking a break is that I'm off to Russia for a, several conferences, as well as on a, something of a fact-finding trip. So when we get back, one of the programs we're going to do, as you know, is the political economy of the Ukraine conflict. And I'm hoping to be able to report uh, a great deal from what I found in Russia and share my impressions with Michael, who I'm sure will also have lots of interesting things to say about it. And also remember, we are going to do our fourth and final de-dollarization show sometime. Um, thanks very much to you all. Thank you to Ben Norton for um, host for hosting our show on his website, to Paul Graham, our wonderful videographer, and also to Zach, who is uh, who always transcribes our uh, uh, our scripts for us. So uh, and thank you all. Until next time, bye bye.